Wonderful. Thank you so much, Bet, for the warm work. Welcome and the kind words. Uh, good afternoon, friends and colleagues, some of our students, many of our faculty. It's always an honor to have the final say, the final word at the symposium. It's wonderful to look back from a SATS perspective on the small beginnings that what is now the symposium had and to celebrate what God has done with it. We can look back on a year where we've had amazing conversations with incredible people from across the world, uh, friends, colleagues, scholars, uh, some practitioners. And I just want to commend the symposium team for the amazing work that they do of serving the SATS family and the SATS student body with great content throughout the year. We are richer because of the the conversations that we have here over the year. So I recently had the pleasure of being in olden day Smyrna, which is modern day Izmir in Turkey, along with Tim Churchill and Hugh Horsen. We represented SATS at the, the ISET annual event there. It was a blessing to be there. But of course, it's a site with rich history. It has rich history because it was to the church in Smyrna that the Lord Jesus spoke these words in the book of Revelation. He said to the church there, be faithful to the point of death and I will give you the crown of life, obviously embedded within a larger communication to the church in Smyrna. But just those words, be faithful to the point of death and I will give you the crown of life coming from our Lord and Savior to the place that we found ourselves in a couple of weeks ago it was challenging for me. And so it gave birth to the question, you know, what does faithfulness look like in theological education? If the Lord's call upon us remains, as I believe it does, to be faithful to him, to be faithful to his mission, faithful to his word, faithful to the gospel, faithful to his calling, what does that look like for a theological institution and for theological programs and so on? So I want to speak as we wrap up the year on about factors that make theological education faithful to its mission or if neglected, factors that make it unfaithful to its mission. Theodore Roosevelt famously said it's better to be faithful than famous. Not a high value system that most people would rather be famous than faithful. And I think, sadly, many Christian ministries would rather be famous than faithful. But deeply embedded in my psyche uh, is the belief that our highest calling in Christ is to be faithful to his mission, faithful to his calling upon us. Almost in the words of scripture that we are called as stewards to prove ourselves faithful. And then the rest is in God's hands. Ultimately, it's his uh, kingdom. It's his church. He builds it. We get to play whatever role he allocates to us in the seasons that he allocates them. So as theological educators, dare we imagine that the Lord Jesus would speak the same words to us tonight or today. Be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. If that is our Lord's calling upon us, then a critical question has to be, what does faithful look like in theological education? What does faithful theology and training look like for us? What are the factors that make theological education faithful or unfaithful to its God-given calling and mission? Now, I want to propose three and maybe three and a half. We'll see how my time goes. By the way, Bet, if you could type in the chat window what the time expectation is, I'd be grateful. Um, so let's look at some of the factors that make theological education faithful or unfaithful to its mission. Firstly, theological education is faithful to its mission when it is wisdom oriented. When it is wisdom oriented. I'm going to suggest, as I said, three key points. So faithful theological education has to strike a balance between studying the word and doing the word, a balance between academic rigor and practical relevance, a, a balance, if you wish, in Pauline language between life and doctrine. 
And my thesis would be that if we err on either side, if we're only concerned about academic rigor and excellence, to the exclusion of concern and a, and a passionate hunger for how our theology plays out in the cauldron of life and ministry realities, we've become unfaithful. And conversely, if we are so practically minded that we're passionate about being relevant and helpful in everything that we do, but, but our hunger for faithfully handling the word of truth, which we'll come to later, lags behind, I think we're also being unfaithful. So faithful theological education needs to strike a very challenging balance, actually, between its commitment to the practical and the theoretical, the, the understanding the word and living the word between rigor and relevance. And we have to walk that, that line intentionally if we want to be missionally faithful. We, you know, it's like saying, which, which is the most important wing on our plane, the left wing or the right wing? <clears throat> In the same way, if we only have one of those going for us, we've lost something critically important. And I think the, the biblical idea of wisdom captures the combination, the integration of those factors, this integration of theory and practice in realistic ways. Roger Ellsworth says, knowledge is information, wisdom is application. Knowledge is comprehending facts. Wisdom, I like this part, wisdom is handling life. Wisdom is handling life. Knowledge is theoretical. Wisdom is practical. Now, please don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not suggesting in any way that we undermine the importance of knowledge. We should be a people who love learning, who love increasing our knowledge base. You cannot apply any knowledge you don't have. You can't live what you don't understand. You can't have spiritual discernment without biblical literacy. They go together. So in order to live the truth, you must first know the truth. Knowledge is critically, critically important, but knowledge on its own is inadequate. So one of my favorite Bible verses is Ezra 7 verse 10. If I ever had something like a life verse, this might well be a candidate for it. Ezra 7 verse 10 in the CSB says, now Ezra had determined in his heart to do, notice the three things he determined in his heart to do. He determined to study the law of the Lord, to study it and to obey it and to teach its statutes and ordinances in Israel. So he was committed. In fact, this language of determined or purposed in his heart that reminds me of Jesus you know, setting his face towards Jerusalem. I, I get the same feeling that this was Ezra's mission. He, that he was, his gaze was fixed on three things, to study, to obey, and to teach the word of God, the truth of God's word. And of course, Ezra got it right. He, he was passionate about studying it, about doing it, and about teaching it. He loved the word, he lived the word, and he helped others to learn the word. And when Jesus calls me home, I hope that those who knew me best will be able to say something similar, that Kevin loved the word, lived the word, just loved it and liked to learn it wasn't enough, but lived the word and helped others to learn it. And may that be true of each of us and of SATS as an institution and others committed to evangelical theological education. As teachers in God's kingdom, we've got to be equally passionate about truth and about life. So Paul says to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.16, pay close attention to what? To your life and your teaching, the daskalia. Your teaching, some translations will say doctrine, the content of what you teach. Pay close attention to your life and your teaching. Persevere in these, for in doing this, what? Paying close attention to both of those in a healthy balance. In doing this, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Now, to do this well requires that we give equal weight to the meaning and the implications of God's word, and that is incredibly difficult. I love what John Stott says. 
fact, I think there's a slide for it. So John Stott says, it's not difficult to be relevant if you don't care about being faithful. And it's not difficult to be faithful. The scripture is the implication. Not difficult to be faithful if you don't care about being relevant. But if you care about being relevant and faithful, it's a difficult line to walk. It is the essence of what a wisdom orientation calls forth from our theological education. Commitment to both, in, uh, absolutely committed to the faithfulness with which we handle the truth of God's word. It's not a national anthem that we sing at the start of a football match and then forget. It's not to be something we tack on to our message to give it a veneer of authority. Our desire as evangelical teachers and scholars and students is to rightly understand the scriptures, to understand them in all of their God intended um, meaning and then transfer that faithfully and relevantly to the settings in which we serve. Challenging to do, but nothing less will suffice for our mission. We have to be committed to being both faithful and relevant, even though that is fairly difficult. We've been going through James in our devotions recently, and James speaks into this issue in chapter three, where he asks the question, who among you is wise and understanding? By his good conduct, he should show that his works are done in the gentleness, perhaps better praites, perhaps better translated as humility. That comes from wisdom. How does God's will, how does God's word tell us to identify the wise person according to James 3.13? Is it by their list of publications? Is it by the impressive number of conferences they've presented scholarly papers at? Is it by the degrees that hang on our walls? Is it by the verbs we can pass or the number of verses we can memorize? None of the above. For James, the yardstick by which you know someone is wise is by good conduct done in the humility that comes from wisdom. I like what Daniel Aiken says about this. He says, a faithful expositor will also be a faithful evangelist. You are not primarily interested in making smarter saints. I hope that sinks in for us as sets. We don't primarily exist to make smarter Christians, smarter saints. We do pray that people will become smarter through their journey with us, but that's not our ultimate mission. Your passion is to make faithful disciples of Jesus who love and obey God. That's a wisdom orientation to theological education. Secondly, theological education is faithful to its mission when it is Bible based. It's faithful to its mission when it is Bible based. What does that mean? Well, one thing it means is that we must teach our theology from a posture of submission to the Word of God, not one of criticism over it or of it. I'll say that again. We must teach theology from a posture of submission to the Word of God, not from a posture of superiority to it or criticism of it. And what better passage of scripture to underscore this point than the famous passage in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, which says that all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God, including the woman of God, may be complete, equipped for every good work. This famous passage, just verses 16 and 17, makes four critical truths about Scripture. Those four truths, probably more than anything else, should shape what it means to be Bible-based. So four core truths. Let's go through them one at a time. Firstly, the Scripture tells us that the Scriptures are, in, are the inspired Word of God. That's what Paul says in the opening phrase, all scripture is inspired by God. All scripture is inspired by God. All scripture is inspired by God. So the, the scriptures are the inspired word of God. Because God is truth, 
His word is completely true in all that it affirms. The theological term for that is inerrant as a technical term, but, but the idea is really simple. God is the source of the writings and because God is ultimately absolutely true, the scriptures are ultimately absolutely true. Because God knows the future, the scriptures can contain prophecies and insights that go beyond the confines of the day in which they were written. An idea that's anathema to the historical critical guild, but is deeply embedded in any evangelical understanding of scripture. God is the source. And if the scriptures come from God, they can speak authoritatively to things beyond the knowledge and insight of the human writer who gave them. It's been said, I don't know by who, but it's been said that if the Bible is not the word of God, then Jesus is not the son of God because Jesus fully trusted the Old Testament scriptures as the truthful, authoritative word of God. And of course, if Jesus is not the son of God, then what's the point of having a theological seminary or theological education? We might as well close our doors as an institution and go and do something more useful because just as Paul said about the resurrection, now, if Christ isn't risen, we're a pitiful crowd. Well, if the scriptures are not the inspired, inerrant, trustworthy, authoritative, normative word of God, then as theological educators, we're in a pretty pitiful business. So it's fundamental to believe that the scriptures are inspired, not in the sense that Shakespeare was inspired, but in the sense that God is the source of them and that they are fully trustworthy. Second thing Paul tells us about the scriptures is that they are profitable or useful in some translations. The scriptures are profitable or useful and it's cause effect. They are profitable because they are inspired. All scripture is inspired by God and we could add the word therefore profitable. It's valuable because it's the word of God, not just the ideas of human beings. When theological educators stop believing that the scriptures are the word of God, as many have and do, they stop believing that the scriptures are useful. When we abandon our high view of inspiration, we also abandon a high view of the notion that the scriptures are useful for all of life and should frame how we think, how we live, how we approach modern day problems. I'll never forget I had an invitation to go and visit uh, to go and visit an institution in Peter Maritzburg a number of years ago. And driving back from Peter Maritzburg, I gave a lift to three honors graduates from the University of KZN. And they had had they were telling me about their journey as theology students in the Department of Theology there. And one of the professors that they quoted told, told them this. He said to them, in my class, don't quote the Bible, quote real authorities. In my class, don't quote the Bible, quote real authorities. When we stop believing the scriptures are inspired, we stop believing they are useful for framing all of life. Thirdly, the scriptures are for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting and for training in righteousness. So they're inspired, therefore they're useful. What are they useful for? He lists four things, teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And those four things have to do respectively with right and wrong behavior and right and wrong beliefs. So they map onto what we should and should not believe, how we should and we should not behave. So the scriptures are useful because they're inspired for teaching us what to believe and not to believe, how to live and how not to live. In other words, the scriptures are, are normative for how we live and what we are to believe. And friends, when theological institutions start treating God's commands as suggestions and his truths as superstitions, they kill. They kill themselves and they kill their students. We could think of the current controversies of our day. For instance, the hot potato debates around things like gender and marriage and sexuality. And I'll say again, when we stop treating God's commands, when we start treating them as suggestions and we start treating his truths as superstitions, our beliefs ultimately will kill.
they'll kill our faith and they'll kill the churches that those trained by us go to lead. The scriptures are useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. They frame what we believe and how we live, both positively and negatively. Now, what's often missed about this famous passage is that it has a climactic so that clause at the end. In other words, the main point of the discussion about the scriptures being inspired is not the doctrine that the scriptures are inspired, critically important though that may be. The main point about this is the so that. All of this is so that something might happen. And that so that is so that the man of God, if I'm not mistaken, only two places the New Testament refers to the man of God. Um, this is one of them. So that the man of God may be equipped or complete, equipped for every good work. So that the man of God may be equipped for every good work. So the, the God, God inspired the scriptures to make his people mature and fit for ministry. When theological education loses sight of God's purpose to disciple and equip workers, the institution sins. The mission of theology is to serve the church, especially to raise up God-fearing, Bible-believing, gospel-preaching, spirit-led men and women. That's our mission. That's why God gave us the scriptures. That's why he calls us to teach the scriptures faithfully. And that is fundamental to what it means to be faithful in our theological education. Bat loves to quote Michael Eaton's statement that theology belongs to the church. The liberals stole it. We need to steal it back. And my heart says amen to that statement. The liberals stole it. We need to steal it back. Theology belongs in the church to, so that the people of God may be mature, equipped for every good work. In 2009, feels like a long time ago now, the Faculty of Theology at Stellenbosch had their 150-year celebration. They'd been in existence for 150 years. And they hosted a combined meeting of all the theological societies in South Africa. If memory serves, there were 13 in all. Now, a few years before, maybe two years before, don't quote me on the timing, the Faculty of Theology and Religion at UNISA had um, lost its faculty status. In other words, the student numbers in the faculty, this is a matter of public record, the student numbers were no longer sufficient for UNISA to retain faculty status. So the Faculty of Theology was uh, closed down and a couple of the departments became different departments under the Faculty of Humanities. I hope I've got the details straight, but the gist of it goes along those lines. So at this gathering in 2009, the former dean of the Faculty of Theology and Religion gave an address explaining the factors that led to the downfall of the Faculty of Theology at the university. And I was in the audience, a packed audience. I was in the audience with many others listening with intrigue because we were a distance education seminary, somewhat similar in many ways to UNISA. So much smaller, of course, but, but similar. We had been accredited for probably seven years or so by the CHE. Uh, we probably had 1,500 tertiary students at the time. And we had no shortage of interest in theology, people wanting to study theology. So it was intriguing. What, what caused UNISA uh, to lose their faculty status? We shouldn't have been able to hold a candle to UNISA. They had enormous funding. We had none. They had a list of impressive professors we had none. They had a famous name, Sats was unknown. And we were even more expensive for, for students because we pay our bills from tuition. So I listened with intrigue as the, the former dean spoke about half a dozen, about half a dozen factors that he thought had contributed to the demise of the faculty. And as he went through each one, I sat in the audience and I thought, you know, that's probably true of Sats. He mentioned things like, um, they didn't have denominations that formally uh, trained their members with them. Well, we didn't really have denominations founding and funding and, and referring students to us either. So there was item after item. And each time he went through one of them, I sort of ticked that off and thought, that's 
pretty much true of sets as well, which means it's not explanatory as to why Unisa's numbers were declining. And I thought the, the speaker seemed oblivious to what was the real reason that theology students would choose to pay more at a little known fledgling institution with none of the gravitas of a big university. That reason is that SATS was Bible based. We teach theology from a posture of submission to the word of God, not from one of superiority over it or criticism of it. And I think that's fundamental. Bible based is the irreducible minimum of what faithfulness in theological education ought to look like. And those who are called by God to serve in vocational ministry don't want to be fed with faith eroding church emptying heresies, such as historical criticism dishes up. They also don't want to be fed with the, the pointless heresies of the modern reader response approaches to scripture. They want to be fed by shepherds who love Jesus, who trust scripture, and whose mission in life is to propagate the gospel. Anything less is unfaithful to the call of theological education. So evangelical theological education, whether it's formal seminary stuff or other modes of expression, needs to be uncompromisingly Bible-based. Since the Bible is a unity centered on Jesus Christ, that also means it needs to be inherently Christ-centered. Faithfulness to our, our mission depends on remaining uncompromisingly uncompromising in our reverence for scripture. Sorry, forgot Michael Eaton. Thirdly, third factor that's critical. Theological education is faithful to its mission when it's context sensitive. So we've talked about it needing to be wisdom oriented, striking the right balance between being relevant and rigorous, between being faithful and relevant, about being Bible-based, being the absolute irreducible minimum. But I believe it also needs to be context sensitive in order to be faithful to its mission. We need to be contextually engaged without being contextually enslaved. We need to be contextually engaged without being contextually enslaved. I like Muller's, these are not his word for word definitions, but these are taken from Al Muller's article that we've been studying as a seminary. And he offers these portrayals of three major isms. He describes liberalism as contextual engagement without theological orthodoxy. I'm so determined to make Christianity relevant to the prevailing culture that I'm prepared to accommodate the truths of our faith in order to try and make it palatable to the people we serve. That's Protestant or theological liberalism. And then he defines fundamentalism as theological orthodoxy without contextual engagement. So we hold to all the right beliefs about the authority and truth of scripture, the person and work of Christ, the doctrine of the Trinity, atonement, salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, etc. But we do it without engaging the questions of the day. Muller calls that fundamentalism. And then he sets up his understanding of evangelicalism, a word that's much up for grabs these days, as something that finds a healthy balance between those two. It's theological orthodoxy with contextual engagement, not contextual enslavement, contextual engagement. You probably know and, and love the story as I do in Acts 17, where Paul arrives in Athens and the news of his strange message starts to spread to the local philosophers, Athens being a hotbed of philosophy in the ancient world. And so they bring him to Mars Hill. And while he's, when he's been engaging the Jews, his custom is to reason from the scriptures in an attempt to show that Jesus is the Messiah, the fulfillment of their hopes and expectations. But on Mars Hill, Paul takes a different approach. We see it in verses seven, chapter 17, verses 22 and 23 which says, Paul stood in the middle of the Areopagus and said, men of Athens, Areopagus being Mars Hill, and said, people of Athens, I see that you are extremely religious in every respect. For as I was passing through and observing the objects of your worship, I even found an altar on which was, which was inscribed, 
agnostotheo, to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, I proclaim to you. And Paul goes to present the gospel. Now, the backstory about this unknown God, agnostotheo, is actually attested in some ancient Greek sources. And we can, not entirely, we can partially reconstruct the story and maybe use some creative license. And I'm following to some extent Don Richardson in his reconstruction, which is based on his reading of a number of the ancient sources. But it seems that during the sixth century BC, Athens was being ravaged by a plague. They had sacrificed to all their gods and the plague continued. Then one of the oracles declared that there was an unknown God who was cursing them because of some of the crimes of brutality that their king had committed. But she didn't know how to appease this God. So she told them to send for a man named Epimenides from Knossos on the island of Crete. He would know how to appease the angry God and save the city. When Epimenides arrived, he had the Athenians release a herd of hungry sheep onto Mars Hill. And the idea was this, that if any sheep that starved them overnight, it was early in the morning, they let them go, any self-respecting half-wit of a sheep would have immediately decided to, to graze. But if any sheep chose to lie down instead of grazing, the Athenians were to build an altar where the sheep lay, inscribe on it the name Agnostotheo to the unknown God and sacrifice of the sheep on it. He reasoned that any God great enough and good enough to save them from the plague would smile upon them if they acknowledged their ignorance of who he was in the process. And the story goes that God caused a number of the sheep to lie down without eating. Uh, he heard their cry, the plague stopped. They built a whole series of these Agnostotheo altars and sacrificed those sheep on them. Sometime later, the elders of the city decided to preserve one of the altars to Agnostotheo in the hope that one day this great God who was unknown to them might reveal himself to them. And maybe if he did, they wouldn't need the hundreds of other idols and deities that they had drawn on. And so when Paul arrived, seemingly he knows the backstory because he quotes what seems to be Epimenides in Acts 17, 28, when he says, for in him we live and move and have our being. It's possibly, perhaps probably a quote from the same poem by Epimenides that Paul quotes in Titus 2, 12, and, and even there calls him a prophet. The unknown God who saved the Athenians from the plague appears to be Yahweh. And now he has sent Paul to reveal his name and his purpose to the Athenians. Now, what does all this story have to do with contextualization or context sensitive in our approach to theology? Well, it has everything to do with it. The account reveals the power and the pitfall of contextualism. The power and the pitfall of contextualism. On the one hand, Paul adapted his presentation in a way that engaged the context of Athens. And he demonstrated knowledge of their history and respect for their history. Even the idea that God had been at work in their history and, and had now sent him. So, so Paul demonstrates himself strategic and sensitive to the people to whom he is presenting the gospel. But friends, don't miss that Paul still preached the gospel as a universal message binding on this foreign culture. So these things show, I think, that he embraced a moderate contextualization, contextualism, but he rejected hardcore contextualism. Moderate contextualism, says Dembski, is recognizing that our thoughts and perceptions are heavily influenced by our context. That's true and good, and it helps us to guard against you know, the excessive trust in reason that was one of the negative consequences of the Enlightenment. Hardcore contextualism sees us as slaves of our context. All our ideas are so biased and so warped by context that truth doesn't exist, only perceptions exist. This view sees our context as isolated, self-contained little worlds that cannot interact meaningfully with one another. It takes, says Dembski, the alienation we experience as a result of sin, and it glorifies it as a first principle. 
And this is prominent in the world in which we live. Context is being glorified to an absolute in the same way that the Enlightenment glorified reason as if it was a first principle and an absolute. And I think Paul, Paul models in Acts 17 that we hold those things in tension. He embraced and engaged the Athenians' context, but he also proclaimed the word of God as a universal binding truth. He preached Christ resurrected and said that God now commands all people everywhere to repent. In our world, he would have been accused of ideological imperialism, of trying to impose his story, his narrative on others. So our theology needs to be contextual. The time for cookie cutter written theologies and courses written and exported as is uh, to radically different context has to have passed. But as we embrace contextualizing and we need to embrace it, we also need to guard against its dark side. The gospel remains a message for the whole world. It announces that there's one God and one mediator between man and God, the man Jesus Christ, and it calls on all people everywhere to repent of anything that's in conflict with the gospel. What should this kind of contextualization look like? I want to suggest two thoughts to you. One, we need to get our questions from the context. Problem, says Glenn Martin, the problem with Christians is not that we don't know the, quest the answers, it's that we don't know the questions. All too often, the problem with our theology is not that we don't know how to answer questions, but that we answer questions nobody's asking. And this, of course, is the fundamental challenge with answers being provided from foreign contexts that don't engage the questions in the places where our students live and serve. So we need to get the questions from the text, from the context. But having got our questions from the context, we must get our answers from the text. This has become a slogan for us at SATS, that the questions come from the context, the answers must come from the text. The answers need to be Bible-based, Christ-centered, and Spirit-led in their approach. There's two sides to this contextual thing. There's a positive where we're engaging the context responsibly while still upholding that God has given us a source of truth that is binding transculturally and transcontextually. And then there's another side that would make us entirely enslaved to context, one that we should reject outright as evangelical Christians. So in conclusion, friends, we can identify the factors that make theological education faithful or unfaithful to its mission. It's faithful when it is wisdom oriented, when it is Bible based, and when it's context sensitive. These criteria apply equally at grassroots and doctoral levels. Faithful theological education needs to strike the difficult balance between studying the word of God and living the word of God, between rigor and relevance, between doctrine and life. Secondly, we must teach theology from a posture of submission to the word of God, not from one of superiority to it or criticism of it. And lastly, yeah, theological education must be contextually engaged without being contextually enslaved. We began with Jesus' words to the church in Smyrna, be faithful to the point of death, said our Savior, and I will give you the crown of life. I'll leave you with the words of Charles Spurgeon, his response to the high calling of faithfulness. He said, I know of nothing which I would choose to have as the subject of my ambition for life than to be kept faithful to my God until death.